So we'll see where all that goes in the next few months until lawmakers leave Albany for the year in June. But let's get into the week's news now with this week's panel. Zach Williams is from City and State, and Yancey Roy is from Newsday. Thank you both for being here. Sure. Thank you. So the big topic that I want to talk about is redistricting. So we got some news this week that the Independent Redistricting Commission basically called it quits. They, they didn't come to an agreement with each other. This is a commission that has one side that's Democrat appointed, one side that's Republican appointed. So I guess we shouldn't be that surprised that there was gridlock. So now lawmakers say that they're going to pass their own set of maps next week. Yancey, what are we expecting out of this? This is a big undertaking to redraw districts and we're losing a congressional district. So it's not just kind of like tweaking the lines here and there. Right. I, I think that there's a couple of things to know. One is that despite the fact that there was a commission and it was going through the public uh, process of trying to come up with maps, there's always been a legislative task force on redistricting. They've had the same data that the commission has had since September. They have traditionally drawn the lines. It's been their role. I imagine they've been working on this pretty much since September. Um, so they are ready to go with their own versions of the maps. And we, it was announced basically as soon as the commission went out that they were going to see maps uh, this weekend. I think that the Senate and the Assembly are, you know, there'll be tweaks here and there in districts and, and not a lot of differences for people. Maybe some important swing districts on Long Island. The real game is Congress. Mm -hmm. And it's because New York is part of a national fight for control of Congress. And, you know, you've got, uh, you, we've seen all sorts of stories in Republican controlled states uh, in the South, mainly North Carolina and Georgia and whatever about redistricting they're doing there where Republicans are trying to add Republican seats. I think so the big thing folks are looking for here is Democrats really trying to use their leverage to draw districts to really bolster the number of Democrats in the New York delegation so that the party has a better chance at controlling Congress this fall. That's the big story. Do we know where the seat comes from, the, the one that we're losing? Does it, do we lose it upstate? I, we have, it's almost assured. Yeah. yeah, we had the chair of the commission on in October, September, that area, and he said it was gonna be upstate. Do, do, we probably don't know where upstate though. Uh, we don't know where until we see the maps, but it's almost completely assured that it will be because A, uh, upstate has not gained population that's the same as downstate, and B, again, Democrats control this, the Republican seats are generally upstate. It's gonna, there's some Republicans who have already said they're not running again. Um, so it's just a, a natural take that um, it's one of those Republican districts is gonna get swallowed up. In the past, when New York lost two state seats rather at a time, it was always sort of a gentleman's agreement that one, the, each party would lose one seat. And that's mm -hmm. how it worked out in sort of backroom deals. Now it's just one seat. Democrats control the process, there's like 99.9% .9 chance that it's going to be a Republican seat that is swallowed up. So, Zach, there have been, uh, you know, rumors from Republicans who say that since Democrats are controlling this process now, they control both the Senate and the Assembly. So they're going to be passing the new maps. So there's, uh, Republicans have said they're going to use this as a way to... Uh, gain ground both, uh, you know, in Congress and in the state legislature. Do we see any indication of that being true? What, what do we know about that? The process can only disadvantage the Republicans, particularly in the state Senate. Sucks to be them 10 years after they gerrymandered <laughs> the state Senate. Now it's going to, it's just a matter of how bad it will be for them. You know, we don't have a lot of indications about the specifics of what's going to happen with the state Senate, but needless to say, it will benefit the Democrats. Something that will be very interesting though, is the Democrats have had super majorities in the state Senate and assembly since the 2020 elections. Um, biggest majorities, I think in like a century or something. And this will be the first time that they actually matter. They haven't, yeah. um, they haven't um, pushed back at all at the executive on any vetoes, overriding them, but they will need a two thirds margin to pass their redistricting plans. In the Senate where there's only 44 Democrats and you need 42 votes, Maybe, just maybe, two or three Democrats could raise a little bit of trouble, but my suspicion is that in the end, they're going to vote in lockstep for a redistricting plan that's going to benefit them in the Assembly, the State Senate, and in Congress, which has na national implications. I mean, do we know how many seats they could really gain by redistricting in the Senate? A memo that was circulated online this week that was attributed to Sean Patrick Maloney, the representative from the Hudson Valley, who chairs the Democratic con uh, Congressional Campaign Committee. 
um, had was floating a 24 to 2 map. That means that Republicans would lose quite a few seats and just two of them would survive. Most likely Chris Jacobs in Western New York and Elise mm. Stefanik in the North Country. That means the only Republican in New York City, Nicole Maliotakis, is probably going to face a tough uh, challenge to get reelected because they're going to move the Brooklyn part of her district to lower Manhattan, which really favors the Democrats. Oh, wow. And she, is this her first term in Congress or is this her second term? I don't remember when she. Believe it or not, she's rest. only been in Congress one term, feels wow. like a lifetime, but this will be a real key test of just how strong the Republicans are in New York City after a pretty friendly 2021 election cycle. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, Yancey, I want to turn back to you. So we saw former Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver pass away this week in prison. Tell me a little bit about what his legacy is going to look like. Uh, you know, now that he's gone, he had a tumultuous time as speaker. He, I don't, was he the longest serving speaker he in history? He almost made the record. Almost, very, just <laughs> if under not, the if wire. Not for the indictment, he probably would have made it, but yeah. Exactly, <laughs> and the end of his, his uh, time there was really uh, poisoned with a lot of, uh, you know, he protected some lawmakers that were accused of sexual harassment from right. allegations. He was uh, convicted on corruption charges. Uh, how will people remember Sheldon Silver? I, sometimes it'll depend a little bit how whatever his actions personally affected you or your community, perhaps. I mean, look, the, he, he was in, place more than 20 years, uh, as you mentioned, second longest speaker in the assembly history. And there's so many ways to like look at this, so many angles. I mean, start from the folks who championed him. He was, he was the democratic face of any opposition of uh, Republican domination during the Pataki years. And during that time, he successfully pushed for a lot of things that Democrats want, uh, pre-kindergarten expansion. Uh, more money for education, more money for colleges, uh, uh, some environmental programs. He was the, the champion of liberal causes for all of that. Uh, but as you said, on the other side, there's so many things that detract from that, especially the ending. He was convicted in a corruption scam, um, essentially steering money through his law firm to get kickbacks is sort of the short term there, short answer there. Uh, the cover-up of Vito Lopez's sexual harassment cases and the secret settlements and how that kind of resulted in changes on how the, the assembly and the state handles those. Um, so there's a lot of mixed bag there for how people can look back over his 20 plus years as a, as a powerful figure in New York politics. And then of course in 2015 replaced by Carl Hasty as the assembly speaker and he's remained in that post since. Uh, I did want to get to the mask mandate but we are out of time unfortunately. <laughs> Zach Williams from City and State, Yancey Roy from Newsday, thank you both so much, I appreciate it.